Uh, oh, Dan's use of them was perfect. Uh, all right, well, anyway, thanks for the invitation to speak here. Um, so there's a preprint. Um, just what I'm going to say. It. Un unfortunately, it had some bad typos. So whoever wrote that had no idea what he was talking about. So, um, but there's a corrected version, so it's, um, it will appear in the archive shortly. But if you want to look at it right away, math.berkeley.edu slash tilde hutching slash beyond.pdf. Um, so, um, so Dan introduced a lot of the um, concepts that I need, but just to briefly, briefly review. So if omega is a uh, domain in the first quadrant of the plane, then we define the toric domain Um, x omega to be the set of z in C2 such that um, pi z1 squared absolute value z1 squared comma pi absolute value z2 squared is in omega. So if omega is a triangle like this, has vertices at the origin at the point A0 and 0B, then this, this x omega is an ellipsoid, which they denote by EAB. Um, and if omega is a rectangle that goes to A and B, then this x omega is the polydisc V of AB. Um, so it, in general, we're interested in when, when does one symplectic manifold symplectically embed into another. And the examples I'll be talking about today will be toric domains and mainly just ellipsoids and polydisks. Um, and then there's, there's special kinds called convex and concave. So uh, a convex toric domain is where, so my definition of convex is a little more restrictive than Dan's version of convex. We call it, I don't know, Danvex or something. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so my version is it is below the graph of a, uh, not increasing concave function, and possibly with the vertical line at the end. Okay. So this is your omega. Okay. So omega is um, x, y, where x goes from, say, 0 to a. So here's a. And um, y goes from 0 to f of x, where f is, uh, is concave and non-increasing. So, so a dance, in a Danvex domain, this, um, this can sort of curl around like that, and this can curl around like that. Um, um, and actually, I, I could prove something about that too, but so the method I'm going to tell you about is pretty general, but I want to sort of restrict attention to, to some specific examples to avoid uh, making incomprehensible general statements. Okay, so that's a, that's a convex toric domain. And a concave toric domain, by definition, is the same as, as Dan's. Um, and it's from our uh, joint paper with a few other people. So it's um, where omega is below a, uh, the graph of a convex function. So then we could, we could say, one, when is one concave or convex toric domain embed into another? So, so Dan, in his talk, told us how um, for a concave into convex, um, um, 
or more generally Danvex, then the ECH, each ECH capacities give a sharp obstruction. Um, but for other cases like um, uh, convex, uh, into, well, whatever. Um, um, for example, a poly disk into ellipsoid So in this case, ECH capacities are not very good. So, so to give an example, um, let's suppose, well, let, well let's, let's consider this problem of embedding a poly disk into an ellipsoid, and let's be a little more special. Let's talk about an ellipsoid into a ball. So let's define, I don't know, say G of A to be the infimum of C such that the poly disk A1 can symplectically embed into the ball ECC, which I didn't know by B of C. So this function says, given A, how big a ball do I need in order to fit the poly disk P of A1? So what is this function? Um, so for example, what is this function when A equals 2? So ECH capacities um, which nobody's going to actually define today um, <laughs> tell you that, that G of 2 is at least 2. So if you B, P of 2 comma 1 cannot embed into a ball of size less than 2. However, there's a theorem of Hind and Lisi which in this notation says that, that G of 2 equals 3. So in other words, you can, you can take the poly disk P of 2, 1, so that's this rectangle like this, and then you can take a, tri a, a triangle um, that goes from x equals 3 to y equals 3 like this. So here we see that the poly disk P of 2, 1 um, is just a subset of the ball B of 3. Okay, so it embeds by just by inclusion. And what Hein and Lisi tell us, so that, that shouldn't be going over like that. Um, what Hein and Lisi tell us is that if you make the ball any smaller, then there's no way to embed this poly disk in there. And so an ECH capacities can't see that. So we'd like um, some more powerful methods. Um, so, so it turns out that that ECH, or embedded contact homology, does see this fact. It just doesn't see it in the ECH capacities. So, so there's a way that I can see this using embedded contact homology, but it can't be neatly packaged into capacities. Like capacities are um, sort of symplectic geometry for the masses, because any uh, sort of idiot-proof tools, anybody, anybody can just crank out capacities. But then when that doesn't work, you have to open up the hood and, and start you know, moving wires around and it gets messier. So that's, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to do that. Um, so anyway, here's a, here's a theorem. Uh, so um, if A is from 1 to 2, then G of A equals 1 plus A. So that's sort of, um, this, is, this is what you get from the obvious inclusion. So you, if you just take, take the rectangle A1, then this P of A1, then this is a subset of the ball um, B of A plus 1. Okay, so, so when the ratio between these two dimensions of the poly disk is less than 2, you can't do any better than the obvious inclusion. Um, now, when A is bigger than 2, you can, in fact, do better. So, so F Felix Schlenk so 
Sorry, my board work's going to be a little disorganized for a minute. So, so Felix Schlenk um, has a book about symplectic folding and other related techniques. And it shows that if, if A is bigger than 2, then P of A1 embeds into B of C symplectically um, if C is bigger than 2 plus A over 2. Um, so the picture is um, you have this poly disk P of A1 where A is where A is bigger than 2, and then you sort of fold it in half. So this, you go up to A over 2, and you can sort of move this piece um, over here. And then there's something funny going on in the middle. But it's sort of, basically you have a rectangle that goes from A over 2 to 2. And then, you, and then that, that can now be embedded in a, the ball B of C whenever, C whenever the ball sort of goes outside of that vertex. You could ask, you know, is that is that the best possible, or can you do any better than that? So I I can prove that um, if um, a is between two and twelve fifths, then this symplectic folding is actually best. So so g of a equals two plus a over two, um, and for for a bigger than that, I can get some lower bounds on this function, but they're, they're not sharp. There's more calculations to do to try to optimize these bounds. Um, so another theorem. Uh, yeah, because I know that with more work, I could make them better. <laughs> but there's a, there's a, as you'll see later, there's a lot of combinatorics. So really. I need someone to throw all this into a computer and see what the computer says. So just to state a couple more results, um, so another theorem. Um, so if, if B is a positive integer, and if A is between 1 and 2, then P of A1 symplectically embeds into the ellipsoid E of BC comma C, um, if and only if, basically if and only if the obvious inclusion works. Um, so that would be, uh, uh, I can never remember what it is. Uh, so a, a plus b is less than or equal to bc. So this is, this, so the obvious inclusion is the best you can do in this case. Um, another theorem, um, we could look at um, symplectically embedding one poly disk into another. Um, so one theorem is that um, if uh, A is between 1 and 2, and if the poly disk P of A1 symplectically embeds into the cube, namely the poly, poly disk C comma C, then C is at least A. So the picture looks like this. So here is your, here is your target poly disk. So this is a, this the, the uh, omega here is a square of side length c, and then if I fill it by a rectangle that takes up more than half of the square. Okay. So if this, if this. Um, if, th if this is bigger than c over 2, um, or bigger than or equal to c over 2, then this, this, simpl this inclusion is, it can't be improved. You, you can't shrink c and still embed this. If, if, c were, 
if this were less than C over 2, then you could, you could do a folding again and, and get a better embedding. But when you fill up more than half of the square, you can't improve on it. Um, there's also a generalization of this when you replace this with um, a general poly disk and not just a cube. Uh, so, um, I mean, pretty much any symplectic capacity can see that if this embedding exists, then one has to be less than or equal to C. Um, so any symplectic capacity will tell you that if you can embed one polydisc into another, then the smaller dimension of the first polydisc is less than or equal to the smaller dimension of the second. So the, the novelty of this theorem is that we're actually seeing the, the bigger dimension of these polydiscs in this case. Okay. So any questions about these statements? Okay, so how do you prove stuff like this? So suppose, so let, let x omega and x omega prime be, be convex toric domains. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a general combinatorial obstruction to embedding one convex toric domain into another. And then in the, in the special cases that I was talking about, then with, with some calculation you can prove these theorems. Okay, so suppose, suppose that x omega symplectically embeds into x omega prime. And just for technical convenience, let's embed it into the interior of x omega prime. So suppose this symplectic embedding exists. So what, what can we do to obstruct that? Um, so let's let, let y be denote the boundary of x omega, and y prime denote the boundary of x omega prime. Right. So then, um, now these, these have um, canonical contact forms on them. Well, at least if, let, let, let's assume that, that these are smooth, which you can always obtain by some perturbation. So if you look at the one form lambda is a half sum from i equals 1 to 2 of xi dyi minus yi dxi. So this, this is a contact form on the boundary of any star-shaped domain in R4. So this, this is a restricts to a contact form. on y and y prime, okay? So then, um, and, and d of it is the standard symplectic form. On C2, um, so that tells us that if you look at x omega, my, I should give this symplectic embedding a name, let's call it phi, um, minus, um, the interior of phi of x omega prime with the standard symplectic form. So this is a, a strong symplectic cobordism from uh, y prime lambda to y lambda. So in other words, uh, uh, Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you. 
I stayed up, I stayed up late fixing the typos in my paper. <laughs> so my, my paper is more clear at the expense of my talk being less clear. <laughs> or typos are just, there's a conservation of mistakes which is being transferred to my talk. Anyway, so, so here's, here's x omega prime, the target, and then here is um, phi of x omega, and then this, this region in between them is a symplectic cohortism between their boundaries. Um, and so we're going to look at holomorphic curves in there. So um, let's call this whole thing W. Okay, so then we take W bar, we complete it. Um, so we're going to take minus infinity to zero cross Y um, union W union uh, zero infinity cross Y prime. Um, so we're attaching symplectization ends to this, and we're going to look at holomorphic curves in here. So, um, so we choose uh, an almost complex structure J on W bar such that um, on the main part of the cohortism W, J is compatible with the standard symplectic form. Um, and then on the rest, um, well, uh, you, well, J agrees with what's called J plus or J minus. So we'll choose a almost complex like structure uh, J plus on here, an almost complex structure J minus. And these should satisfy the usual conditions for defining contact homology. Um, so, um, so J plus or minus is R invariant. Um, preserves uh, preserves the uh, contact structure kernel of lambda, and since the derivative of the R direction S. Um, to the ray vector field R. Okay, and then we want to look at J holomorphic curves in here. So I, um, well, okay. So, um, suppose that C is a J-holomorphic curve in this W bar. Um, which is asymptotic to, um, well, so it's going to be asymptotic to a bunch of ray orbits on the positive side and a bunch of ray orbits <coughs> on the negative side. Um, so let me, let me just schematically denote this by alpha plus um, uh, and alpha minus. So this is a uh, collection of ray orbits with multiplicities. Um, and y prime, and this is a collection of ray orbits with multiplicities in y. So if any such curve exists, then a Stokes theorem calculation um, tells you that the integral over alpha plus of the contact form lambda is greater than or equal to 
the integral over alpha minus of the contact form lambda. Um, so this is basically because the symplectic form is um, everywhere not negative on a holomorphic curve. And all symplectic embedding obstructions that I know how to prove, not necessarily all obstructions, but all that I know how to prove come from this inequality. So we, we want to prove that there exists some holomorphic curve in this cobordism. We want to figure out what ray orbits it's asymptotic to. And then we just calculate these numbers and we get an inequality. Um, so then the question is, what are the ray orbits that could arise and what holomorphic curves can we prove have to exist? about P of A1 into P of CC. Um, I mean, the, res the, result I, the result I remember was about whether whether this one embedding is, is isotopic to this 90 degree rotation of it. No, but, but I remember because I, he also had the result that you could embed things when A was just between one and two, and then, uh -huh. and then the folding was sort of showing, showing you could bend them. Yeah, so I have the feeling because when you look at the group, the black and white, so the, so the one is sort of the slope, then the iterated would be two, but if the A is between zero and two, so you have the second group, so it's closer to the A side. And then the CC is on. Then if this would be smaller than A, I think you get sort of a fluctuation. I think it's the second group would be some other kind of Okay. All right. I would, I would have a look at that. All right, well if there's an easier proof of this thing, then yeah, great. It doesn't match up on Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this was, this was a conjecture, stated as a conjecture in a paper of Felix Lang from a while ago. So at least as of like 15 years ago, he didn't know this. Um, well, so. All right, so, so to, be, to be continued. Um, okay, well, but I. I, I, can't, I can't prove theorems live in real time, so I'm just going to continue to tell you the stuff that I already know. <laughs> um, all right, so, so what are the ray orbits in the boundary of x omega? Okay, so we actually want to perturb this a little bit. Um, So, and then here's, here's our convex domain omega, okay? So there's, there's a ray orbit up here. So sort of the moment map image of this point on the axis is a ray orbit. Um, and I call that one E10 for reasons I'll explain later. Um, and the moment map image of this point is a ray another ray orbit, which I'll call E01. And then for every point on the boundary of omega, so let's assume that this, this, um, this the second derivative of this uh, function is negative. Okay. So then for every point where the slope is rational, so if the tangent, if the um, tangent line to omega has rational slope, so this is slope equals minus b over a, um, where a and b are, are positive integers that are relatively prime, then, so at this point, there's actually a, um, 
a torus, which is invariant under the rape flow. You get an S1 family of rape orbits. Um, and after perturbation, these become two rape orbits, so th which I denote by EAB and HAB. So the orbits EAB are elliptic. So that means the, the linearized rate flow around this orbit is, is a rotation, and it's actually a very small positive rotation. Um, the same will be true for E10 if you perturb this graph to have very slightly negative slope at the end here. Um, and the same will be true for E10 if you perturb the graph so that the slope is nearly vertical at E01. So these are elliptic with small positive ro rotation number. Um, and HAB is a, hyper, is a positive hyperbolic orbit. Um, which means that the linearized return map has positive real eigenvalues. Um, okay, so then we can combinatorially encode one of these collections of rave orbits. So the statement I made is that when you take the boundary of x omega, then after slightly perturbing it, that what the rave orbits are is through these rave orbits E10 and E01, together with, through every point for which the tangent line has rational slope, there's uh, an elliptic orbit EAB and a positive hyperbolic orbit HAB. And th this is only true up to some simplistic action level. So you can say all rave orbits of length less than a million are described this way if your perturbation is sufficiently small. So definition, so a, a convex generator is a uh, commutative formal product of symbols EAB and HAB. where no symbol HAB is repeated. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you that in a second. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the action is, um, it's the cross product of this vector with the integer vector going like this. Um, so, you, so this is the vector um, minus a comma b. So the action of this orbit is the cross product of the vector from zero to this point in the boundary of omega with this integer vector minus a comma b. Um, okay. So then a, a convex generator is you, you take finitely many of these symbols, EAB and HAB, and you can repeat the EABs if you want, but you can't repeat the HABs, and you multiply them together. So this is a combinatorial way of describing a union of Rabe orbits in which you're not allowed to repeat the hyperbolic ones. Um, and then we can draw a picture of this. So equivalently, so one of these, one of these generators is equivalent to a um, polygonal path well, it's so it a sort of convex polygonal path or well, what, what did I call it in the paper? I called it a convex integ integral path um, so without writing down the whole definition of what it is I'll draw you a picture so it's um, it's a path going where the edges of this path go between lattice points. Um, so there's an example. And then each edge is labeled either E or H. And um, 
horizontal and vertical edges have to be labeled E. And non-horizontal or vertical edges can be labeled either E or H. So this, this, what I've drawn here, this corresponds to the formal product. Or this is E10. Um, this one, this H means you actually do um, E, E11, H11. So that corresponds to this edge. And then this edge, this is supposed to be a bigger slope. Let's, let's fill in the lattice here. Uh-oh. Uh this lattice is seriously not to scale. Um, <laughs> all right. So then this, this edge is um, E12, and the last edge is E01. So, so basically, you take your formal product, and you just write the factors in order of, of uh, decreasing slope. And then you think of those as vectors, and you just draw them in the plane like this. So you can either draw these pictures or write down these products. Um, then that means you have a longer edge. So it's like if, if I label this edge E, then this, this would be E11 squared. So repeating an edge means you just, you know, you have an edge which has a lattice point on its interior. And I'll write down what I said about the symplectic action. So the symplectic action of the generator So this depends on your domain omega. So I'll denote this by a omega of, I call this path lambda. Okay. So if lambda is one of these paths, so a omega of lambda is the sum over v and edge of lambda. Of the, um, the vector corresponding to this edge cross product with um, uh, omega, uh, what, did I, what did I call this? So omega v, no, let's not call it that. Let's call this a p omega v. So this vector is the vector from the origin to the point on the boundary of omega whose slope corresponds to the set. So that's this vector here. Um, so this vector here is p omega v. And then v, in my convention there, it goes the other way. So that's v. So you just sum up the cross products of these vectors. Okay. Um, so and of course, the symplectic action is this over here. So what that's telling me is that in my cobordism, if I can prove that there are, if I have a convex generator if I have two convex generators, and if I have a holomorphic curve between them, then this combinatorial expression for one is bigger than or equal to the co this combinatorial expression for the other. Um, okay, and then there's the ECH index. So this is a topological quantity, which doesn't depend on omega at all. So this is I of lambda. So this is two times L of lambda minus 1 minus H of lambda, where L of lambda, this is the number of lattice points in the region enclosed by lambda and the axes, including all lattice, all lattice points on the boundary. And this h of lambda, this is the number of edges that are labeled h. Or equivalently, if you think of lambda as a formal product, it's just the number of symbols h, a, b that appear in that product. Right. So with those definitions out of the way, I can now state a kind of combinatorial black box, which gives you an instruction to embeddings.
So theorem. And then we need to make a little more space for this. Well, I guess I can use this word. Okay, so, so let x omega, x omega prime be convex toric domains. Um, suppose x omega symplectically embeds into x omega prime. Uh, But lambda prime be a convex generator with all edges labeled E. Um, and there's actually, in the actual statement in my theorem, there's an extra assumption or two, which I think is not really necessary. So I'm going to put a little asterisk here, because this is what I think is true. And the actual theorem that I can really prove for sure is a couple of extra irrelevant assumptions. Okay. Um, okay. So then, there exists um, a convex generator lambda with the same ECH index as lambda prime. Sorry? That's right. So the dimension of convex generator doesn't depend on domain. The ECH index doesn't depend on the domain either. The only place where we see the domain is in the symplectic action. So all, all the boundary of any convex toric domain looks like any other, except that the symplectic action is different. OK. So there exists a convex generator lambda with i of lambda equals lambda prime. OK, so so far this contains no information. Um, a positive integer n um, Um, and factorizations so lambda is a product lambda 1 times lambda n so this means I'm thinking of these now as products of these symbols EAB and HAB so lambda is factored into n factors um, lambda prime is factored into n factors lambda 1 prime to lambda n prime such that For each i, the following hold. So now we're actually going to get some non-trivial conclusions here. So first of all, um, the index of lambda i equals the index of lambda i prime. Second, and more significantly, the action of lambda i is less than or equal to the action of lambda i prime, or of omega prime. Okay, so the omega action of lambda i is less than or equal to the omega prime action of lambda i prime. So what's going on here is there's actually a holomorphic curve in the cobordism. So we're on the positive ends of the holomorphic curve are in the ray orbits corresponding to this lambda i prime, and the negative ends are on the ray orbits corresponding to lambda i. So this comes from that Stokes theorem calculation. Um, and there's one additional very important condition, um, which is that x of lambda i plus, I'll tell you what these are in a second, plus y of lambda i is greater than or equal to x of lambda i prime plus y of lambda i prime plus m of lambda i prime minus 1. Now, in this last condition, uh, so what the notation means is if I have one of these convex generators lambda, 
So x of lambda just denotes the x coordinate of the lower right endpoint. And y of lambda denotes the y component of the upper left endpoint. And then m of lambda is the total multiplicity of all the edges. So an edge has multiplicity one if there are no lattice points in the interior. If it has k lattice points in the interior, then the multiplicity is k plus one. So m of lambda is the total multiplicity of all edges. Okay. So what's going on in this theorem? So the reason why this theorem is true is because we can use this embedded contact homology machinery to show that there has to exist a holomorphic curve whose positive ends are at lambda prime and whose negative ends are at something, which we'll call lambda. Um, and it's a disjoint union of a bunch of components. So these components, there are n of these components possibly repeated. Um, and each of these components has ECH index zero, which gives this, you this first equality. And each of these components, just by virtue of being a holomorphic curve, leads to the second inequality by Stokes theorem. Um, and this third condition, this third condition is telling you that the genus of this holomorphic curve is non-negative. So I've taken the not so profound fact that a holomorphic curve has non-negative genus and I've sort of calculated combinatorially what that means in this particular example. But then this, this inequality actually is key in um, getting the applications. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's a genus, genus G curve with some number of functures and G, G cannot be negative. Or if it can, I'm going to have to really rethink a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, right. Um, yes. Um, okay. So that's the idea of why it's true. But if you didn't like all of that, well, th you can treat this as, as a combinatorial black box. So, so to, to use this theorem, you don't need to know anything. You just need to play with the combinatorics of these convex generators and have a little practice. Well, this is a little less easy to use than capacities. But if you like, I, I can show you how to, how to prove the hein lisi result with this. But these convex generators then um, generate the ECH complex and the boundary The boundary operator is not zero. It's not zero. It is zero if you apply it to a generator in which all edges are labeled E. Uh -huh. um, but in general, it's a very non-trivial chain complex. That's right. In fact, there are these extra assumptions, which I didn't tell you, which ensure that this cycle represents a non-zero non homology class in the chain complex, which I think are not necessary, but I haven't proved that yet. Okay. I shouldn't have, I really shouldn't have erased all that shit. Um, right, sorry. <laughs> Very bad planning. So action lambda is sum over edges of some, some cross, something cross something. Okay, now, uh, yeah. Can I ask a quick question about the condition? Yeah. So, if we think about it in terms Um, right, so this, I was going to say that a little later. Um, so yes, there's a key technical fact, um, which is that, so, so the ECH cobordism map um, is actually defined using cyber witten theory. And um, whenever this count is non, whenever this, this number is non-zero, there exists some holomorphic curve, but it could be broken and, have, and be horrible. 
Um, but it turns out that in the case where the domain of your embedding is a convex toric domain, these technical difficulties go away. Um, so you don't have to worry about these negative ECH index multiple covers. So that makes it possible to actually understand what these curves look like. Um, the same is also true if the target is a concave toric domain. So for a, a convex or a concave into a concave, I can do something. And for a convex into a convex, I can do something. The one case where I can't do something is for a concave into a convex. But that's exactly the case that Dan took care of this morning. So. All right. So in case this, the statement in this theorem is a little hard to digest, let's just practice with, a little, practice with it a little bit. So here's the proof that if P of A1 symplectically embeds into V of C and A is between 1 and 2, then C is greater than or equal to 1 plus A. So the, the case A equals 2 is the, the Heinle C result. Right. So let's suppose that um, A is greater than or equal to 1, that P of A1 symplectically embeds into B of C. And let's suppose you get a contradiction that C is less than 1 plus A. Um, and we want to prove that uh, A is bigger than 2. Okay, so that's, that's our goal. So our goal is to show that A is greater than 2. So how are we going to do this? So, well, so let's, we're going to apply the theorem to uh, lambda prime uh, equals E11 to the D um, for D equals 1, 2, and 3. Actually, I'm only going to apply it for D equals 3. Um, okay. So what's this generator? So, so the, the picture, uh, so 1, 2, 3, da, 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 da. So this is this uh, line labeled E. So for practice, um, the ECH index of this. So I of E11 to the 3. So if I were teaching class, I would make the students answer it, but um, I won't do that here. So we have to count the number of lattice points. So the number of lattice points is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We subtract 1 and multiply by 2 to get 18, and there's no H. So this is 18. That's true. All right. You want to do the next one? <laughs> All right. So then the action. Um, for the ball, well, this is 3C. Okay? So this has symplectic action 3C. Right? Now I'm going to apply the theorem to this. So when we apply the theorem to this black box, out comes this lambda and then this n and these factorizations. So n, n can only be 1, 2, or 3. In fact, n equals 1. So there's a bit of argument to show that n equals 1, which I'll skip. Okay, so that means um, so that means that I of lambda is also eighteen. Um, now the action of lambda 
for this poly disk P of A1, what it comes out to is um, X of lambda plus A times Y of lambda. So that's the, that's the symplectic action. For any, for any generator for the poly disk, the action is just, um, you just take the X and Y coordinates and multiply them by the dimensions of the poly disk. Okay? Um, so then this has to be less than or equal to uh, the action for um, the omega prime, which is 3C. Okay, so we know this. And then this last condition tells us that X of lambda plus Y of lambda is greater than or equal to something. So what's the something? So this, this X of lambda prime is 3, the Y of lambda prime is 3, the M of lambda prime is also 3. So this is, has to be greater than or equal to 8. Okay. So X plus Y is at least 8. So then what are the possibilities for lambda? Um, so if, suppose Y of lambda equals 0. So that means it's, it's all, it's all on the, on the uh, X axis. And because its index has to be 18, it has to go out to the point 9 comma 0. So the only possibility with the correct index is lambda equals E1, 0 to the 9. Um, so then, in that case, this number is 9. So that tells us that, that 9 is less than or equal to 3C. And because I assumed that C is less than 1 plus A, this is less than uh, 3 plus 3A. So then if you uh, um, look at this inequality, that tells you that A is bigger than 2. Right? What if y of lambda is bigger than 0? Well, so x and y have to add up to 8, and this y is at least 1. So this thing is at least 7 plus a. Okay? So you get that 7 plus a is less than or equal to 3c, um, which is less than 3 plus 3a. And this inequality also tells you that A is bigger than 2. So either way, A is bigger than 2. Okay, so that's just, that's just an example of calculation using this theorem. So it looks a little weird, but if you, with a little practice, you can start cranking out these corollaries, which I stated at the beginning. Um, and there's lots more calculations to do if anybody's interested. Um, Um, right, so if so, you have to you have to do some similar calculations to show that n is equal to one. If n is bigger than one, well, there's, there's a very small number of cases to check. Um, so you just check them, check them all, and rule them out. So, so uh, e not index n. yeah, yeah. So either the so index would yeah, either the index would be too small or the action would be too big. All right, so um, was there anything else I was supposed to say? Uh, I, I guess not, so there's, there you go, thanks.